And now turn with me to the book of Ephesians. We're going to be um, in chapter 6 and uh, this morning, starting in verse uh, 5. And uh, we're going to be moving on. And, and Andy, could you shrink that note section for me? Sorry, it's a little too, it's a little too big there. I can't see all of it. Um, but anyways, it, we've been considering the marriage relationship. Last week, we considered the parent-child relationship. And, and now we're going to consider another interpersonal relationship that, that ironically enough, it seems secular. It seems like the Spirit of God wouldn't be interested in this. Like, what's spiritual about going to work? What's spiritual about vocation, you know, working and vocation? But the Spirit of God is interested in this. The Spirit of God wants to control and influence believers even in this interpersonal relationship. And what we're going to see, because we've got we to gotta deal with this as we get into the text, we're going to see that the working class uh, citizenship of first century Roman Empire was organized and regulated much differently than it is today in our day. In fact, we're going to see Paul use the term masters and slaves. And there were slaves. We're going to talk about that in the first century Roman Empire. There were indentured servants. Oftentimes when you couldn't pay a debt, you know, they didn't send a debt collector after you. You, you actually had to give your life in service to somebody until you worked off that debt. And those were considered slaves as well. And so verse 1 thus states this. I'm sorry, not verse 1, verse 5. Verse 5 says, Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ. And so we see bond servants. This is that word. It means slaves. It means somebody that's in a permanent relation of servitude to another. And this is, this is what existed in the Roman Empire. But what I want to talk about this morning is there are certain things in the Bible that are descriptive, but not prescriptive. You know what I mean by that? It means it describes the way things were, but it's not prescribing the ways things should be. There are things like that when you record in history. And what we're going to find about the Christian faith is the Christian faith doesn't seek harmony by overthrowing social institutions. That's not how the Christian faith has ever worked. Servants are still servants after they trust in Christ for their salvation. Masters are still masters after they trust in Christ for their salvation. Criminals are still criminals after they trust in Christ for salvation. I mean, imagine, you know, that's, that's the big joke in prison, right? Everyone, they, they met Jesus in prison and now they should get out of prison. Well, no, that doesn't even work in our culture. They can trust in Christ in prison, but they still have to serve the remaining sentence. It doesn't change their social structure. And so Christianity is very much that way. It's not seeking to bring harmony by changing social structure. It's seeking to be, bring harmony how? Through, through heart responses to the word of God and heart responses toward other people. And so the Bible doesn't condone slavery, nor does it, does it also convince of its violent overthrow. You won't find any teaching in the Bible on that at all. In fact, what it's going to do, and this is the main point, this is kind of the main principle, wherever the gospel finds you in life, respond accordingly as unto the Lord. That's the main message, regardless of where you're at. This isn't a sermon on slavery, but it's just saying whatever circumstance you're in, live heartily as unto the Lord, whatever that is. You can be the Fortune, you know, Fortune 500 CEO, or you could be a lowly janitor. It doesn't matter where you're at. Your life has value. Your vocation matters to God. Your response to how you work out your vocation matters to God. That's the main point that we want to drive through. Now, one of the things we've got to understand about the, eight, uh, the, the slavery in the first century is it's not the slavery of the 1800s. I want everybody to get out of your mind, cotton-picking, kidnapped slaves from the continent of Africa. That is not what we're talking about in first century Rome at all. In fact, let me give you a couple of facts as slavery existed in first century Rome. Did you know that what, roughly one-fifth of Roman Empire's population were slaves? Those of you that don't like fractions, translation, 20%. 20% of the population of the Roman Empire in the first century were slaves. That, that is just mind-blowing. It, it, that would have totaled around 12 million people at the outset of the first century AD, just to put that in perspective for us. And, and the economy was highly dependent on this workforce, both in skilled and unskilled labor. Do you know that in larger cities, such as Rome, Corinth, even Ephesus here that we're dealing with in this book, that roughly one-third of their citizens were slaves? That's 33%. 
And not only that, but another one third had been slaves before at some point in the past. So can you imagine going into a city of Ephesus, looking around, and two thirds of the people that you're looking at had either been a slave in the past or were currently a slave in the present? This is a much different concept than what we think of in terms of what caused our civil war even. In fact, the average length of time for a slave in the Roman Empire was seven to 20 years. Again, a lot of this was indentured servitude. When somebody would fall into debt, they would work it off through slavery. Again, depending on their training, this is fascinating. When I just studying this, it's like it's mind blowing. But depending on their training and their master's needs, slaves would function in multiple capacities, both inside and outside of the house. You know that slaves could be teachers, they could be cooks, they could be shopkeepers, they could run a business for their owner, they could be doctors, they could be lawyers. And that's a little bit different than what we envision slavery. Um, in, you know, the 19th century and the 18th century in America, in Britain. And so you can see this was the skilled workforce or the unskilled labor force is is what slaves represented. You know, from a glance on the street, you couldn't even tell the difference between who was a free person and who was a slave. They would would blend in. You couldn't even tell. Uh, There was no significant difference in their dress or their responsibilities or where they would go or their freedom of movement within a city. So none of these things, um, could you tell the difference? So the same thing a a free person could do, a slave could do as well. Do you know if the master was displeased, the slave could expect appropriate discipline. Some masters are a little bit kinder than others, but the law provided a wide range of discipline to the extent of flogging or, or even death. And we have historical record during this time. In fact, Aristotle, you know, a couple centuries after this, wrote that a slave is simply a living tool. A slave is, is simply a part of the agricultural property of a master. And so there was some negative views of slaves. There was also some, some positive views of slaves. Um, but some of the more extreme punishments that we have in history is um, there was a, a master that crucified one of his slaves. We, we know that there was a master one time that would, would punish his slaves by breaking their bones. There was, there was one guy recorded that he would actually amputate his slaves' body parts if they had done something wrong. And so you can see some extreme cruelty. Um, some, uh, I remember one story of a, of a master that actually poured hot tar on a slave. I remember another, another master, he had a, a pond full of um, man-eating fish, like I guess piranhas or something like that. And if a slave acted up, they'd throw him in the pond and let the fish eat him. I mean, just crazy, mean, uh, uh, obnoxious stuff. They're, they were rare, but they were permissible by law. So that's what's so fascinating about what we're about to read, these instructions that we're about to see from Paul. Now, some slaves were so well-loved that masters were releasing them upon their death. In fact, Augustus Caesar actually legislated that masters couldn't do that anymore. He restricted the amount of masters that could release their slaves on death. Um, So bond servants were a a highly populated group of people. And this is where it comes into the Ephesians. Many bond servants were probably a part of this church. Again, in Ephesus, a third of the population were slaves. A third had been slaves. And so this was a very meaningful teaching to probably a large group of people in the Ephesian church. And it could have had an impact not only in society, but also in the local church. Because now you've got bond servants who are slaves. You've got masters who are slaves. How do they interact with each other on a daily basis now? What, What is God's will for them? It used to look like this, but what should it look like if master is controlled by the Spirit of God? and slave is controlled by the Spirit of God. What, is, what kind of harmony can that bring? That's what we're going to look at in the instructions. So this is really the context of our passage, and we don't want to get too far away from that, but we also want to make application our day, right? We, we believe the Word of God has value in our day, and so what is the application? Well, the closest and most direct application for us and our society is the working class. And so you'll hear me go back and forth this morning, and I apologize in advance, but it's, it's slave employee and master employer. And that's kind of the application that we want to bring forward for us in our day. And I think the question <clears throat> is really a good question. The implied question for us as we try to apply it is if this was important for slaves who were not treated well, who were not valued, who did not get remuneration, who often had difficult circumstances, 
how much more important is it for employees to respond to the Lord in their daily vocation? And see, that's, that's really where we want to kind of drive this home. And so we see this command in verse 5. It's to be obedient. It's the same word that was used for children back in verse 1. It means to listen to something with stillness. It means to pay attention in order to answer. It's a present tense command. It, it, Paul desires an immediate and urgent response. Remember, obedience is, is comprised of a compound word in the Greek, meaning to, to listen under. So, so even within the word, it implies subordination. It, it implies that you recognize an authority figure that's over you, and you are willing to listen under that authority figure with a desire to respond positively to their instructions. <clears throat> and, you know, I think any of us that have, that have worked a day in our life realize how easy it is to fall into a mindset of rebellion. Now, we wouldn't call it rebellion because that's like, you know, the R word. <laughs> you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't get that honest with ourselves that that's what we're doing. What we would say is, well, I, I'm just questioning what the boss says. I, I, just, I just don't think the boss is taking into consideration everything. And, and so I just think it should be going this way. Um, so we wouldn't call that rebellion. We would just say, you know, we're just really trying to help the boss, you know, get better. And that's, and that's not true. We're complaining. We're griping. We're rebelling. We are not obeying with a mindset of listening under to respond to what they are doing. We're always criticizing. And all you need in a place of employment is a coffee pot, and you will find the complainers. That's what you need. You, you can sniff them out. You can, you can smoke them out. That's where they'll come out. And so this is very important to understand that, that some people get upset even with the boss. You know, the boss is driving a Lamborghini, and here I am barely paying my bills. How dare that guy, you know, take advantage of me? And so lots of different ways that we rebel. The mindset that the Spirit of God wants to produce in an employee is to listen under, is to be ready to respond and then their primary and immediate response should be one of obedience. Again, listening to what the boss says, having a desire to execute what the boss says. doesn't mean you can't communicate with your boss if you're seeing something that may help the business. The point is this, your mindset and heart is, I'm going to obey. I want to respond positively to that. This is what a spirit-filled employee will do. This is what a spirit-filled mindset should manifest itself in each one of us that are employees. Now, what's interesting about that, and I think it's because Paul really wants us to get this, not just glance over it. He's going to qualify obedience now. He's going to qualify it in five ways as we go through this passage to really give us the heart behind this command. Because I think Paul knows, I think Paul uh, understood this probably from a personal level as well, that at some level when you hear obedience, you can still obey and be unacceptable to the Lord. Do you know that? That's kind of a fascinating thing to think about, right? You can obey, do the right thing, and your attitude, your heart behind it, your motive, <clears throat> makes your obedience unacceptable to the Lord. I mean, we even see this in the Old Testament, right? I mean, God says what? I desire what? Truth in the inward parts, not sacrifice, right? It, and, and you're like, wait a minute, I thought he set up a whole sacrificial system. The point is this, he wanted their heart involved. He wanted their mind engaged in that sacrificial system. Because when Israel was at their worst, you know what they were doing? They were dropping off sacrifices at the temple and then at the same motion going up the hill to sacrifice their children to Molech. And you're just like, what in the world? <laughs> you might as well just stay home from the temple. I mean, that ain't gonna please God. I mean, what are you, what are you trying to appease? And so we need, our minds and hearts need to be engaged if you're an employee, this is the point. You've got to be filled by the Spirit. Again, flowing out of 518. So let's look at some of these qualifications. Verse 5. <clears throat> First qualification is, is this phrase with fear and trembling. That's always a, an interesting phrase in the Bible. It's used a few times. Um, let's just define the words. Fear means fear, terror. It can also mean reverence or respect and honor. And then trembling means a trembling produced by fear. Typically, when you put these phrases together, these two words together, it expressed great timidity or profound reverence or respect. Okay, so it was a way of saying, 
hyper respect maybe or hyper honor. And you know, it's interesting because you see this used a couple of other places in the scripture as it relates to the concept of obedience. And it reflects, as we'll, we'll see, thoughtful, intentional response. It's, it's a considerate response. It's not just obeying to obey. It's a very thoughtful, intentional heart attitude, if you will, behind doing the right thing, responding to your employer. You know, Philippians 2.12 tells us what? To work out your salvation with what? Fear and trembling. That's, that's one of the phrases. And so notice it doesn't say work for your salvation. You can't work for your salvation. Salvation is a free gift. Salvation was bought and paid for by the finished work of Jesus Christ. Nothing left for you to pay Only thing left for you to do is to trust in God's solution that he paid it in full. And see, that's why even the song we sang earlier, All I Have is Christ, I I hope that's the cry. I I hope that you don't think something more of yourself than what you should. I hope you think all of Jesus Christ because he's the one who accomplished for you and I what we could not accomplish for ourselves. And so we see that in Philippians 2.12, that to work out your salvation, not working for it, it's living it out. That, there's, that God has a desire now that you're saved, now that you're part of the, the family, he has a desire in the way that you live to bring him glory. And he does, he says, do that with fear and trembling. Do that with intentionality. Do that with thoughtful consideration of the Lord. Do that with thoughtful consideration of the resources you possess in Jesus Christ. All of these things come into play. One of my favorite passages that really, I think, helps me understand this phrase, fear and trembling, a little bit better, 2 Corinthians seven fifteen. Paul's writing to the Corinthian church. He's writing about Titus. He says, because Titus had visited them. And he says, and his, Titus's affections are greater for you, the Corinthian church, as he remembers the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. They weren't afraid of Titus. They weren't, their knees weren't knocking because Titus was in town. The idea is that they responded in such a way that they received Titus, that they were considerate about his needs, that they responded to what he instructed them to do. See, it was a, it was a considerate, heartfelt, paying attention to Titus. They weren't just blowing him off. They weren't just going through the motions. They received him with fear and trembling. And this is what Paul uses here in Ephesians to qualify obedience. I think that the combination of these words provides us a New Testament equivalent of what we see a lot in the Old Testament of walking in the fear of the Lord. That's the same concept. It's just, will you take thoughtful consideration of the Lord as you're about to respond to your employer? Your employer says, sorry, John, you're gonna have to work overtime again this week. And in that moment, (laughs) right there, when, when everything in your gut wants to just tell him off and slap down your resignation letter and say, I can find a better job than this, The Spirit of God wants to remind you, walk in consideration of the Lord. How would the Lord have me respond in this situation? It doesn't mean that maybe I don't need to find a new job at some point, but in that that moment, it's more important that you respond to the Lord instead of react to your boss. This is the qualifications that come through in obedience. One commentator said of fear and trembling, it's an earnest zeal in discharging your duties. And I, and I like that. It's this earnest zeal. It's this, you're paying attention. You're not just letting it rip. You're paying attention to how you react and respond. And so this moves us to the next qualification of obedience. He describes it as being obedient as in sincerity of heart as to Christ. And when we look at sincerity, it means singleness of heart. You're, you're not, uh, it, it, you're pure about it. You're not um, it's the opposite of duplicity. And, and notice where he's, he's navigating here. He's navigating this at a heart level. It, this is genuineness. This isn't as the boss walks in, hey, boss, how you doing? I've been thinking about you, man. It's so good to see you. And as soon as he leaves that little scumbag, <laughs> that's not sincerity of heart. That's the opposite of what he's talking about. That's phoniness. That's not genuineness. You know, I, I, I said this last night to a group. I said, you know, um, when I'm driving and I'm not speeding, I don't care if there's a police officer on the side of the road or not. I don't really care. It's like, I can wave to him, blow him a kiss. I don't, you know, I'm going the speed limit. But what happens the second I'm speeding? Break, right? I see the police officer, break. I know I'm doing something wrong and I'm, and I'm driving in a duplicious way. 
I'm driving in a duplicitous way. Here, we're talking about relating to our employer. The, the obedience that we want to have doesn't need to be with duplicity. When he sees us, we'll go on to eye, servants, uh, eye service here in a second. In other words, don't be two-faced. Don't be one way around the boss when he's around and one way when he's not around. This is the point of the command. Treat your boss the same exact way that you would treat Jesus Christ, assuming that with Jesus Christ, you couldn't get away with this type of behavior, right? I'm reminded of the story in the Old Testament where, where God uh, appears to Abraham and Sarah and promises Isaac. And you remember what Sarah's response was? She's in the tent, right? So she thinks she's kind of away from being seen. She starts laughing. She's like, ha, ha, ha. And uh, the funniest exchange, the angel of the Lord says, why were you laughing? She says, I wasn't laughing. And he's like, yes, you were laughing. And that's like the end of the exchange. It's like the Lord knows. The Lord knows when we're being fake with our boss. He knows when, when our obedience is not coming from this sincerity of heart. Now he goes on to describe a, another qualification in verse six. Let's read verse six. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. So again, I service. It's exactly what we we're just talking about. Service being rendered only when you're being scrutinized, only when you're being watched. You're only doing what you do when you're being seen. When you're not being seen, you could care less of the job that you're doing. And he's saying, don't do that. That is not biblical obedience in this vocational ministry. This is not the type of obedience that the Spirit of God wants to produce in your life. In fact, every, every employer on earth, they may not know why, they may not understand why, but they should say, I want as many Christians working for me as possible because they work. They do what I tell them to do. They don't give me any lip. They don't complain about this and complain about that. I never see them gathering around the coffee pot. And then when I walk in the room, it gets silent. They put their nose down and they do the work. And they do it with a joyful attitude, which we'll see also comes into play but here, he's saying, this is a person who just wants to look good when the boss is around. And you know that people put more emphasis on looking good in front of the boss instead of just being a good employee? They put more energy in looking good than just being good. You can, if that's your mindset, you can actually relax a little bit. You don't have to work harder when the boss comes around. You just keep working the way that you always work. And when the boss notices you, he notices you or she notices you. And when he doesn't or she doesn't, it doesn't matter because you're not doing it for them. You're doing it as unto the Lord. Man, it frees you up. It just frees up our mindset. We don't have to have all this bitterness and angst and upset feeling towards somebody that's over us in employment. We are looking past them to our true master. This is the whole heart behind these qualifications here on obedience. Again, not as men pleasers. Your only goal is not to please men. You've got a higher calling here. Uh, and again, it just speaks to the motivation of this. Why do you do what you do? I want you to just think about that at your place of employment. Why do you do what you do? Lots of motivations, right? Make more money, get a promotion. Let's be honest, look good in front of our boss so that maybe we can get a raise or something like that. Those are all motivations. Fine. Those are all very practical motivations. I think what Paul's saying is have a higher motivation driving all that and that do it as unto the Lord. Audience of one, Jesus Christ is watching in fellowship with him, controlled by the spirit of God. You can be the dream employee to your employer, regardless of how they treat you. And so again, this is not the attitude of an employee who is walking by means of the Spirit, somebody that's just a man pleaser, someone that's just an eye pleaser. This is somebody that's controlled by the Spirit of God. Brings us to our fourth qualification of obedience. He says, but as bond servants of Christ, again, doing the will of God from the heart. Again, where are you doing the will of God from? Externals? It's going through the motions? Keeping my boss off my back. You know, it's many, many employees might say, I just want to keep the boss off my back. Right? I just want to stay under the radar. I just want him, him or her to leave me alone. We should have a much higher motivation of that. By the way, who are you a bondservant of? Your boss? What does this verse say? Look at verse 6. 
You're not a, a bond servant of your boss. And oftentimes that's how we think of our employment. I think I'm, I'm an employee of XYZ company or X, XYZ person is my boss. You know, ultimately, whether you <laughs> work for a, a human authority or you own your own business, you've all got the same boss. We've all got the same boss. We're all owned by the same person. We all report, so to speak, to the same person. And there's only one personnel evaluation that we should care about at the end of the day, and that's what Jesus Christ thinks of us and the job that we're doing in our vocational ministry. And you say, why would the Spirit of God care about that? Because when you enact and walk by means of the Spirit of God in your vocation, you bring glory to God. Look at the examples in the Old Testament. Joseph sold into slavery in Egypt. Look at how he rises in prominence in that land, even after being put in prison for something he didn't do. Look at the life of Daniel. We've been studying that on Saturday nights with the young adult small group. Look at how faithful he was in his vocation and how he rose to prominence in two world empires, Babylon and Medo-Persia. Daniel rose to prominence in high levels of authority in that government because everything he did, he did it as unto the Lord and it was recognized that this guy's unique, this guy's special. In fact, the way the pagans described him is there's a unique spirit in him. (laughs) The spirit of the gods, they would say, you know, in their pagan way. This this dude's unique. He just does things well. He does things with a a good attitude. And and this is the mindset going into job. I know probably in in a group this size, there are people in this room that dread their job, hate their job, are miserable about their job. And largely, some of it, it might be because of the people you report to. This right here gives you the ability to say, you know what? I'm not going to focus on the Yehu from Kalamazoo anymore. I'm going to focus on the Lord. I'm going to be occupied with what the Lord thinks about my response in all of these situations. And so this would have been huge for, for anyone in Paul's day, remember what, was, what slaves in his day could have been subject to, to disobedience. We're going to see even from the, the, the opposite of verse 9 that, that many times masters would motivate slaves through threatening. And so they were dealing, some of these slaves were dealing with threatening masters, uh, threatening all sorts of things. And so this right here gave them the internal motivation to, again, not react to their boss, but respond to the Lord and tap into his resources. So again, doing the will of God from the heart. Again, it's not just doing the will of God. It's what? It's coming from the heart. And actually that word there is not hard. It's not cardia in the Greek. It's suke. It's the soul. It's, it's the inner person. It's coming from who you are. This is where this response is coming from. Again, in contrast to what? Just externally complying. There's lots of people on earth that externally comply with instructions. And yet, you know, if you've been in authority, they're following your rules, but you can tell their heart's not in it. You can tell they're not really with you. They're doing what they're telling that you've told them to do, but they're not really with you. And that's a little disconcerting when you realize that, that their heart's not with you. And so this is what he's after here. And so this moves us really to the fifth and final um, qualification of obedience. And it has to do with our attitude. Let's read verse seven, with goodwill, doing service, as to the Lord, and again, not to man. Goodwill uh, is, is a word that means a kindly supportive feeling or a positive attitude. Now he's talking about a good attitude, okay? As, it, as if the other qualifications didn't bring this out, now he's going to specifically state it. You're going to obey, you're going to listen under with the desire to do what the boss says, and you're going to have a good attitude about it, if and only if you're filled by the Spirit of God. The only way you can pull this off Again, going back up to 5.18, that's the flow of this passage. Doing service means literally slaving it or serving it. The word goodwill brings out, again, the way in which we are to serve it. It talks about why you do, how you do the things that you do. Good attitude, good zeal. Good attitude, good zeal. In other words, you are just dying for an opportunity to obey your master. You ever thought about that at work? I'm just dying for an opportunity to respond and and obey my boss. Or you're like, that boss, if he comes in here, she comes in here and tells me, adds one more thing to my plate today, I'm going to let him have it. We don't, we don't, I mean, oftentimes we just need to be challenged in the way that we're thinking. You know, one of the things that we need to realize too, it's it's not a matter of 
your right or what you deserve from your boss. It's a matter of your fellowship with the Lord. That's what it's about. You know, your boss is not going to treat you well all the time. Your boss is not going to value you or, or, or even maybe he, he or she may never realize the worth of what you bring to the company, may never even realize it. But you know what? It's not your job to make them realize it. It's your job to respond to the Lord. And this is where Paul is, he's just knocking out the legs out from under us where we just want to start pointing out excuses for why we are knocking ourselves out of fellowship with the Lord. And he's saying, you know what? No excuses. Do what you do as unto the Lord. Do you think that Jesus Christ sees when you put in extra effort? He does. Do you think that Jesus Christ sees when your heart attitude is good, even when you're being criticized by others? He sees all that. He sees all that. And that's why he's going to go on in verse 8 and says, and guess what? When he sees it, he's going to reward it. You know what? Don't worry about the reward or lack of reward that you get now in your job. Realize that you're working for something eternal, and it will be worth it all, as the old hymn says. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. That, that attitude, that mindful attitude that you take in your employment you know, in fact, our service is to be done as if our service was being provided directly to the Lord himself and not some imperfect boss. You know, this mindset alone would change the face of employment for every Christian that works in the workplace. If this attitude was brought into the workplace, wow, we would see an in increase in production. We would see an increase of value in every aspect and sphere of life. And that is what Christians are designed to do. Not come sit in a building, take in information, fill a notebook, and then go home and do nothing with it until the next Sunday when they crack open the notebook to the next page. That's not Christianity. It is come here, get equipped, go out and impact your sphere of influence. And this is a very practical way. It seems unspiritual, right? It seems like worldly. It seems secular. How could that be spiritual? God sees those as intertwined. God has got you, each person that's in the workforce, exactly where he wants you right now. He has placed you in that job around the people that are around you, and he can use you in their life if you'll simply walk by means of the Spirit. If you'll simply rely upon the Spirit of God and take this kind of mindset and attitude towards your job, get away from the coffee pot. <laughs> Seriously. Just start leaving the get. Bring your coffee from home. Don't even go there. There's no reason to even engage in this type of negativity towards your boss when the Spirit of God wants to produce a positive volition from you, a positive response to him or her. And so there's something that we know. Paul's going to give now a reason um, for why he's qualified obedience. What do we know? Why is this important? Well, look at verse 8. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord whether he is a slave or free. And so the ultimate motivation is now given. There, there's motivation before, fellowship with the Lord, pleasing the Lord. But here's the ultimate reason why. There's a reward that awaits you. And I know, uh, and let's just be honest, immature people want the reward right now. I, I remember even being in a sales position one time, and I, and I was trying to negotiate my pay with the owner, and I said, well, this is great. I see a lot of benefit. Like if I reach certain goals later in the year, I might make more money. But what about some short-term goals? <laughs> and, and this is the way we think. What, what are the short-term goals? Well, let me tell you, let me tell you the short-term goal. Now, I don't know if this will flip your switch or not, but it should. <laughs> short-term goal, goal is you're in fellowship with the Lord. Short-term goal, you can begin to enjoy abundant life. You, you, in my job? Yes, in your job. You can enjoy walking with the Lord in the midst of a situation that's not perfect, and you can take your eyes off of the person that's giving you the most grief and put your eyes on the one who delivers you from that grief. See, it's, it, there's some benefit. There's some short-term benefit, but, but if you want even more benefit, there will be a benefit in the future. It will be worth it all if you buy into this mentality and you allow yourself to be controlled by the Spirit in your workplace. Knowing here is the word uh, for knowing intuitively. In other words, it's not something that you come to by a process of knowledge. It's something that we all know or have common uh, intuitively. And so what do we know? We know this, that whatever good you do, and again, it's God who gets to define good. It's God who gets to define acceptable. But at some point, 
God is going to evaluate that and he's going to reward that. And you say, even in my job, I can receive spiritual reward one day. Even in my job, I can bear spiritual fruit. Yes. Why do we think that the only way you're going to bear fruit is if you preach on Sunday mornings? Why do we think that the only way you're going to bear spiritual fruit is if you teach a Sunday school class for 30 years? Why do we think that we're only going to bear fruit if we witness to every single neighbor every single day of our life, or we witness to one person before we go to bed every single, or that we have to be a missionary to bear fruit? Each one of you can bear fruit wherever you are at in a day. You can bear fruit while you're cleaning the dishes. You can bear fruit to the Lord while you're changing a diaper. You can bear fruit to the Lord while you're driving a truck, while you're putting together a thingamajiggy, while you're doing whatever job that you are working in. If you do it as unto the Lord and you're walking by faith, he will reward you. We need to understand this has got value, eternal value. And we need to be convinced of that. We need to stop working, thinking, oh, I'll just, yeah, I work for that employer. He gives me my paycheck. And then I go do the spiritual things on the weekend. No, you are, you can be spiritual regardless of where you're at. You don't have to be. I mean, there's nothing special about these chairs or this carpet or these walls that you have to be here to be spiritual. We come here to get equipped we go out and live in the world, and there is an impact you can have on the world. And this is the encouragement here, that as you do that, as you buy into that, as you walk by means of the Spirit, God will reward you someday. That ought to be incredible motivation for us. In fact, the, the standards by which God measures good um, were detailed above in all the qualifications on obedience. Again, many slaves just think that their obedience is enough, that that's a good work, that they'll be rewarded, but it's not going to be good in God's evaluation. And that's what we're after, right? People who serve because they care about what the boss thinks, they just do good. They don't even care about their motivations. They just want the boss to think that they are doing good in motivations. This goes to the heart of it. God who sees everything, who judges the uh, mankind by the secrets and intents of their heart, sees it all. And imagine on that day, appearing before him at the beam of seat judgment of Christ for believers and him evaluating your service and your job as acceptable as rewardable. That would be such a blessing for each one of us. And this is what he talks about here. Notice it's, uh, you may, may not have noticed, it's, uh, it's in the third class condition, meaning the fulfillment is uncertain, but it's still likely. And so Paul is assuming that the slaves will respond in a positive way and thus have a reward when they get before the Lord. Again, this good is returned to them by the Lord. Now, does this guarantee material riches or benefits in this life? It, it could. I mean, it's not guaranteed. That's not what this passage is teaching, but it, I mean, you could. You could benefit. You might get a promotion. You might, you know, advance in your career, and that probably can happen, but it's not guaranteeing that he's talking about this future reward evaluation at the Bama seat judgment of Christ, and this is, again, where he evaluates good works, right? Are they acceptable? Are they not? He's not evaluating your sins, at the Bema Seat Judgment, as we've talked about before. Notice it's will receive. This would have been so encouraging to a slave. It's a future indicative. It's a promise. This will happen. This is not a might. If you do it, well, you might get some. It is you will receive it. That would have been incredible for the slave of Paul's day. This means that no slave is excluded because many masters would break their promises over and over to the slaves. Again, what this tells us that no, regardless of the status that you're in in life, um, it has no bearing on the reward that you're going to receive from the Lord. Your status, your, your economic status, your social status, your hierarchy in life has no status. You can bear fruit. And what that tells us is, is this, that a master, an owner, a millionaire might bear less fruit or receive less reward at the judgment seat of Christ than a slave or some believer who's poverty stricken, who doesn't own a business. This is what's incredible about God's economy. It's totally different than the way we view success and failure in our economy. Again, God's measuring stick and calculator don't take into account someone's net worth or their bank account. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Like he's real. He's genuine. He knows the real skinny on everybody, including what you do, why you do it, what's your motivation behind what you do. And now let's move forward to the owner and employer. Uh, we see in verse nine, it says, and you masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, 
knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Notice he says, do the same things. Well, what same things is he talking about? Well, in the context, it looks like he's talking about the good things. The good things from God's perspective, now that they are to put back on the employees or upon the slaves. That's what he's talking about here. And he's going to specifically explain this, what it looks like. Um, But the basic is this, the same way that slaves are to respond to their masters in like kindness with honor and respect, the masters are to respond to the slaves. He's going to give us some details here. In fact, he says, do the same things, present, active, immediately and urgently respond and do things this way, engage in these good things. And what we're going to see is there's one very practical thing that they can stop doing. That's what we're going to see in the text. And then he's going to give a reason for that. And so the thing that they can stop doing is is what we find in verse 9. It says they can give up threatening. And this was a major tool in, in, in masters and even in employers in our day. It's a little bit different, but a major tool in motivating employees to work hard. Is, is threatening. And so he says, give up threatening. Give, giving means to send up, to let up, to relax, to stop doing something. Just, in other words, let it go. <laughs> let go this, whatever, wherever you learn this in business school, that you need to threaten people to get the most out of them, let that approach to your employees go. And I can already hear people say, well, I don't know if that would work with my employees. I think they need a little kick in the pants, you know, or whatever. But we're talking about the Word of God here. <laughs> we're talking about God who's wired everybody, who's created everybody, who knows how these things work. He is telling the masters to give up threatening. Relax your approach. And the word threatening means to be a menace. Or, or when you declare that you're going to harm someone particularly if certain conditions aren't met, there's going to come harm to them. And you know, often masters in these days would use threats of harm or, or harsh consequences. We read about some of them, right? If you, don't, if you don't stop dropping the silverware, I'm going to throw you in that pond of man-eating fish. You know, it's like these, these threatenings, these harsh threatenings. But, but even on a, uh, on a different level, what about, you, you ever had a boss like cuss you out to your face, threaten you but with very vile language? And that's, that's kind of an outflow of this kind of threatening. What about ex, uh, threats of extreme violence? I mean, that's very much the case in this day. They could extremely hurt their slaves. Amputation, you imagine? You know, you drop, your, you drop that milk one more time, I'm going to cut your finger off. And like, oh, nuts. Take my pinky, you know. I mean, I don't, I don't know what they would say, but you, there's this extreme violence and threatening. You know, there was, uh, especially in those days, but it's still the same, there was sexual harassment of female slaves. There was a threat of taking male slaves and selling them off to split them up from their families. That even happened in the first century. So there's all these threats. And Paul is saying, if you're a Christian master, by the way, he's addressing Christians here. And he's saying, if you're a Christian master, master, the spirit of God doesn't want to use the model of motivation to motivate your employees, period. He doesn't want to do that. I think that jumped forward one. Yeah, that's okay. We'll go forward. And, and the reason that he says this, go, to, go back to verse nine, is there something that you know, okay? Do the same things to them, i.e. The, the good response to them. Negatively, give up threatening. Just put that aside as one of your motivating tactics. Why? Because you know something. Knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Again, this is something that masters know intuitively and instinctively. They don't have to sit through a course to gain this knowledge. They understand this, that even if you are the, you know, the king of the hill, so to speak, in your employment world, you still report to somebody else. It doesn't matter how high you go up the ladder, you still have, you're directly reporting to somebody else and it's the God of the universe. And you, and you treat your employees the same way that he treats you. That that funnels downhill in that sense. So Paul is, is appealing to all that they already know about God. That he views all people with value 
and worth. So that's the other problem with employers, right? If they don't take an interest in their employees and they view this employee as better than this one because they're older, younger, they do more for me, do more for the business. And there's this value proposition across the board that you look down the line at every one of your employees and you treat them with honor, value, and worth the same way that Jesus Christ views them. And it's that getting that mindset through to the master. Again, why does Paul bring up the concept of partiality here? Because this was a definite class system found in the first century church. We have a, uh, you know, we have a bit of a class system here. It's a little bit different. I mean, you could say it's not as uh, prominent, but it still exists. Um, you, can, you can see that uh, play out. In fact, I'm reminded of a, st- a story I saw this week. You know, the Rams were, and maybe some of you saw this, but the Rams were celebrating a Super Bowl win. And uh, they were doing their parade, and their star quarterback was on a, a platform, and he was with his wife, and a photographer went to, to go take a picture, and bless her heart, she was just like this. She started backing up to get a good shot, and she fell off the platform, and it was an eight-foot drop. And it's a ter- terrible video because right, right when she falls, the quarterback just looks at her, and he's like, oh, my gosh, and he just walks away, starts drinking. And his wife goes racing over to try to like, see if she's okay. But it wasn't a good look. You know, what would have happened if the owner of the Rams had fallen? How do you think his response would have been? I mean, he would have dove down there, like held his head and, you know, cupped his head in his hands, you know. But there was this partiality response there. And so obviously when we're employers or or leading a, a business, this should not be the case at all. Again, it's not true with the Lord. Both slave and master were of equal value and worth in his eyes. So so this morning, we've kind of closed out this section. We almost had like a mini section in Ephesians on these interpersonal relationships. But I think the reminder that we need to take away is, is sometimes you can, you can hear a message like this and you can become very legalistic because you're like, oh, I need to start applying it this way, this way, this way. Just remember this. That's true. We want to apply the truth. But understand before any of this was written, 518 was written. 518 is the foundation and the basis for why you can obey. And let's just read that before we close. It's kind of leaving that in our minds and thinking, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. You want to be a better employee, be filled with the Spirit. You want to be a better employer, be filled by the Spirit. That's the exhortation that we need to occupy ourselves with. And then these will be the manifestations when we do that. Let's close there with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to dig into your word today. I know this, is, um, this can be a very practical area, Lord. So we want to we see you work it out in our lives practically. Give each one of us wisdom as to how um, these truths can relate to our own specific situations. And uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.